Hey guys, Verbal Engine 95 recording live from Willow County Prison Cell. Uh, first off, I want to say congrats to everybody. We uh, we did it. We made Death Battle. That ruined it. We made Death Battle. Uh, we made it come back. So we're just waiting on that, I guess. Um, what we're not waiting on is the episode I'm going to do right now, which is one uh, I did wait a while to do uh, because... One of the shows I, I just did not watch, and <laughs> I do not watch currently, um, I've heard it's really good, I've heard a lot of people like it, uh, I, I just didn't, um, I just was never drawn to it. That show is Jujutsu Kaisen, and um, it's because this fight is uh, Raven Branwin, Bronwyn, I guess from Ruby, another show I have mixed opinions about. And uh, Toji Fushiguro from Jujutsu Kaisen. Uh, the idea is the battle of the deadbeat parents, right? Um, so, starting with this, um, I did Raven first, right? Yeah, I'll start with Raven because it gives me an opportunity to say this. Um, I've I've made no secrets about my opinions on Ruby before. Uh, I've been kicked out of several Ruby groups because of it. Um, it is my favorite show. I hate watching um, the every medium of the every aspect of the property is great except for any official medium by which it comes out. Right. The, the, the store, like the world is great. Like the world building is great. The characters are great. The, the, the fanfic is great. Like all of that's awesome. The soundtrack is awesome. The co core concepts are great. Um, but specifically the writing is, has torn and the company that was behind it for a very long time, uh, tore it to shreds to the point where, it's, uh, it's unrecognizable. And also the fan base, uh, doesn't like anyone speaking their mind about anything. Uh, if you want to assume that I have some toxic opinion about it, go for it. But no, nah, I mean, that's just basically what I just told you is the, uh, is the equivalent, right? Um, but I do try to keep that out of any ruby fight i've done and i have done a lot of them despite this being a show i hate watching because like i said it is a property i love so you know i i of course i would gravitate to it more but uh yeah anyway going on to this uh yang or no raven raven because i was gonna say she's yang's uh birth mother um who was in a relationship with her father tai yang and walked out on them um, it is because she and her brother Crow belong to the same, uh, tribe of bandits who, the Branwin tribe, tribe, who, um, you know, are known for just being, like, not just fighters and, and thieves and murderers and all of that. Um, and all they really do is survive. That's their whole basis, right? They survive through strength. And, um... Raven was originally chosen alongside Crow by Osbin to, uh, you know, like help protect and, and, and serve him and everything, but I made him sound like a cop, but, uh, Crow left his tribe and Raven used anything that she gained from that to protect it. So that was the whole, yeah. Even saying that her and Crow joined Beacon and learned to become Huntresses just so that they would have the skill set to be able to better protect their tribe. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and that's not with, she, not that she's not able to, because, uh, Raven is, you know, of some of the more powerful characters in Ruby, I would, I would argue. Um, she's, Yang's mother, so the apple did not fall very far from the tree there, but, um, she's a, she's presumably an expert swordsman, because other sword-based, or not, well, other characters have kind of just, like, seen her and not 
you know, and, and people typically don't want to fight with her, so she only has, like, one fight in the series, to be honest with you. But uh, it is a pretty epic one. And from that, we see her abilities on full display. Uh, it was a fight with Cinder, by the way. Another character that I've already put in a death battle. <clears throat> put in two, actually, now that I think about it. I forgot the Ezdeath one. Um, but the fight with Cinder showed us that she is uh, extremely quick. Some of that might have to do with the fact that she's also a maiden. She has, I think, what, the spring? Because Cinder has the fall maiden's powers, funnily enough. Uh, Winter has the winter maiden's powers, also funny enough. So I think, I think Raven's the spring. So we just don't know the summer one yet. I think, right? I, 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 I believe that's the case. Anyway, um, like all of the maidens, these powers give her the ability to uh, manipulate nature as a form of magic. So you're thinking. <clears throat> elements of wind, controlling the weather and whatnot, and Cinder uses, the, or uh, Raven uses this power. Uh, we see her have a lot of uh, ice manipulation on display, which is weird because, you know, you'd think that would be the Winter Maiden's shtick, but no, Cinder pretty much used that the uh, the entire Cinder fight, or yeah, Raven pretty much used that the entire Cinder fight, and um, yeah, even she's done things like free, you know, she's froze things on contact, she's uh, created a giant ice storm. She's created a giant ice sword. Um, she's basically flown or at least jumped very, you know, very high up and used the wind and everything to propel her movement. So that's, you know, it's something that, it's something that even in Ruby, there's not a lot of counters for is just like being able to control the weather around you. Um, but that's not to say her actual abilities aren't, uh, aren't anything, you know, aren't something to worry about. She, her semblance isn't suited for combat. It's, um, she can open up portals to tell, to basically teleport to people she cares about specifically, or has a, a link, like a connection with. The only people we've seen her do that with are Crow, Ty, so I guess Summer, Yang, and there's presumably one other, because we see her opening a portal for Summer, which means maybe she has a connection with Salem? We don't we don't exactly know that. But point is, that's not really something that she can utilize mid-fight, because it doesn't really benefit her to escape, like, in a portal. Like, that doesn't end the fight, right? Um... Yeah, it's not like she can just use it to jump around and teleport. No, she actually has to go to a specific destination that is not in her control. Uh, however, she does have what most Ruby characters have, and that is an aura, right? Um, aura being the manifestation of a person's soul that allows for things like a semblance, but also allows for basically a force field that surrounds a person's body that... Uh, takes hits that would normally be lethal, like gunshots, sword wounds, etc., etc. Um, so with that, and also a dust sword with her, or a dust sheath with her katana that enables her to use, you know, dust in her, on her blades like weapon, like, uh, you know, like elemental manipulation, similar to how Mertnaster does it. Uh, yeah, she is a very terrifying opponent, and it's kind of a shame that we've only seen her in one fight before. Um, the next thing, uh, oh, sorry, next is, uh, Toji, who I had to not remember, forget the name of, because, again, I don't watch the show. Um, but I did do, so, I did do a good amount of research on it. Um, and I did watch the fight scenes that he was in. So... Toji is um, the deadbeat father of is his name Megumi, I believe, or Megumi, whatever. And uh, yeah, he sold his son to a tribe of sorcerers, uh, sorcerers in the Jujutsu Kaisen, uh, you know, terminology, as in like training him to become a Jujutsu sorcerer. Um, a because he wanted the money, and B because he 
thought that he would be better off being trained by the sorcerers, honestly. Even though he was an ass- he himself was an assassin meant to kill sorcerers. <laughs> I guess he didn't consider that. Um, but I don't think he thought that too thought too hard about it because at the beginning of the show we see that he actually forgets that he has a son. Uh, but what he did not forget is that he uh, had, I believe it was a, it's, it's a process done on his body that basically takes away all of his cursed energy or takes away all of his spiritual energy or whatever they call it in Jujutsu Kaisen. Takes away the power scaling system, right? But in return, actually amplifies all of his physical properties. So he is among the most deadly of uh of all of the characters in the show and this is a show with gojo in it um he's deadly fast and strong i mean like not like it, it's like albert wesker wishes you know what i mean like he um the guy can pick up uh manhole covers and throw them like frisbees right he can he can flick rocks and have them end up like bullets uh he's he's fast enough to i mean within fractions of a second to cross distances of like you know hundreds of meters he's he's deadly super super human speed and strength uh he's also apparently a master of pretty much all forms of weaponry um, he, which is good because one of the very few jujutsu magic things he uses is a, it's called a cursed beast or something. And it's basically a little worm that he can increase the size of that he uses to store weapons and he can shrink it down and, and, uh, and basically ingest it and keep it in his body it's because cursed weapons or cursed items, whatever they're called, uh, give off a spiritual energy. And he doesn't, uh, but because he doesn't give off a cursed energy, he's essentially what he—he's essentially invisible to most sorcerers who can sense people on spiritual pressure or spiritual energy. So this is an incredible tool for him. But it's what's more incredible is his incredible tools. Actually, um, he carries with him a sword that nullifies any uh curse that's put on the area so if he's he can use it to cut through barriers he can use it to nullify techniques and whatnot um he has a chain that is literally infinitely long so long as he holds on to one part of it when he uses it so he can stretch it out to any length um and uh the big one i wanted to point out was he also has what's called the Split Soul Katana, which, as you know, is going to be a factor in this fight because I remember the name of it and didn't remember the other ones. Or is it the Soul Split Katana? I think it's the Soul Split Katana. Anyway, this is a sword that... And I think this is honestly going to be the most impactful one no matter what the fight is. But this is a sword that, as it is worded, uh, ignores any physical durability of any object it strikes, provided that object has a soul, right? Because it cuts directly at the soul. So it bypasses any physical durability to cut directly at the soul. So that means no matter how strong you are, how tough you are, what kind of anything you're wearing, like, it will cut through it like it is not there. It does It does cut it. It doesn't, like, just phase through it, right? It does cut through whatever he swings it at it. It's just there is no sense of durability, right? It does not resist the blade at all. The blade cuts through it effortlessly and cuts directly at the soul. This makes it uh, incredibly deadly. Now, soul in the context of Jujutsu Kaisen uh, more or less is also like the manifestation of their power, you know? Like, they use their soul to gain their abilities and whatnot. Domain expansion is basically... Well, it's basically a stand, to be honest with you, but it's similar to a semblance where it's based on your who you are as a person. Um, so yeah, he's able to 
he's used this to cut through giant monsters effortlessly. Not that he couldn't with how freakishly strong and fast he is, but, you know, having a hack sword like that um, doesn't hurt. And this guy is also strong enough, especially even strong of spirit, that uh, being brought back to life by basically somebody just reanimating his corpse with no intention of bringing back who he was as a person, completely leaving his soul separate, he was still in control of his body. Um, and he used it to take out a giant monster like Dagon, who basically just controls all sea life. And, uh, yeah, he, he killed that fucker. He, re he killed that guy to death. Like, it was... <laughs> it was brutal. Um, and he still had the wherewithal to actually end his own life when he was being made to fight his son. So, kind of wraps up as an ending there. Uh, but who do I think wins this fight? So this is... This is not necessarily an easy one, because the obvious factor, and the factor that would probably be most relevant towards Toji winning, would be the, the, the Soul Split Katana because it would completely bypass Raven's aura, right? Because the aura is the manifestation of a person's soul. It's a force field that, you know, reflects pretty much lethal damage in most cases. And uh, it's usually the reason a Ruby character wins on when I do an episode with a Ruby character and the opponent doesn't have a way to deal with it. But the wording on the soul split katana, not on the katana, but like when people describe it, is that it cuts directly at the soul it doesn't cut to the soul like until it hits the soul it doesn't cut or uh, you know everything but the soul it it cuts at the soul directly meaning not only is any durability that feats that she would have now like i would argue that cutting her sword doesn't count you know what i mean like if he gets into a sword fight it's not gonna just cut through her sword cleanly because Oh, it, it's not her soul, but, like, he will be able to cut away, physically cut away her semblance. Because this is a katana that is meant to cut souls, right? Um, so her semblance is not going to last very long, and therefore not neither is her durability. This will also affect her ability to use her semblance, or sorry, I, I, mean, I said semblance, I meant aura, right? Her aura is not going to last very long, and neither her durability. This will affect her ability to use her semblance. Uh, not that her semblance is really usable in combat anyway, but it won't, what it won't affect, and this would be the reason that Raven would win, uh, if she were to, would be that Raven has access to the Maiden powers, which are just magic and completely separate from semblance altogether. Not to mention, she also has a, you know, dust at her disposal, which, uh, you know, is also just another layer of weapons. So... Unlike normal, um, this fight is actually kind of the opposite of what I normally do, where I say, you know, you know, a lot of times characters are close enough matched that physical, unless one is drastically stronger than another, um, physical feats won't really be the relevant thing. It's whatever factors outside of that, you know, put one character, in a, you know, in, uh, give them favor. But, with this case, the factors that would normally do that aren't, you know, it's kind of counterbalanced. Because on one hand, yeah, Goji has a weapon, or Toji, I said Goji, not, um, Toji has a weapon that can take away her aura specifically, but pretty much all of the rest of his weapons are going to be useless, uh, because they're mostly meant to deal with creatures with spiritual pressure and even if you can say aura is equivalent to spiritual pressure or not spiritual part like spiritual energy um you know she's not gonna have that once he hits her with that katana so but she will have magic and magic is kind of i mean i would argue magic Magic in Ruby operates fundamentally different from magic in Jujutsu Kaisen simply because Jujutsu Kaisen magic is like emotion and, and again, like spiritual, you know, a person's like soul and whatnot. Whereas in Ruby, it's closer to like, 
it, it's closer to something like, uh, you know, just the power of nature. But that's pretty much... The only thing is, okay, if we say magic is one is one energy, right? If we say magic and ruby is the equivalent of magic in, in JJK, that would be that Toji probably wins. But, to be honest, I was going to lean that way anyway, because I was going to say this fight really does probably come down to strength and speed. They both have incredible weapons and incredible ways to deal with each other. But, yeah, no, um... Toji is absolutely, in my mind, faster and stronger than Raven. Um, even giving her the ability to fly and whatnot probably isn't going to help. Because, as we've stated, Toji is kind of used to dealing with this shit all the time. Granted, he's used to not being able to be seen. Or, uh, or at least be sensed. But Raven doesn't really have that power to begin with anyway, so... She wouldn't be able to sense him. Um, yeah, so he's pretty much walking in with the same advantage that he would against a person like fucking Gojo, right? And, like, I don't think we can really say that, or a giant monster like somebody like Dagon or somebody like, right? Like, a lot of the characters that Toji's fought, I think, really... I mean, yeah, Raven's realistically fought, like, a ton of Grimm and stuff before, but we don't... Again, we've never really seen a lot of her fights. Um, I just think the scaling is, is kind of off. But also, it's the fact that, like, we've seen how fast Toji moves, and I don't think Raven's equipped for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, Toji go ahead, go ahead and uh, takes it. And it's mainly just because... He's just stronger. I mean, yeah, like I said, there is some hacks involved, but and there might be some up in the air questions like the magic thing I brought up. But um, yeah, I think Toji takes it anyway. Verbal on your ninety-five. See ya.